William Dudley Pelley wasn't shy about his ambitions. He bragged that he was the first American to embrace Adolf Hitler's ideas in the US. He openly talked about how he wanted to establish a dictatorship based on a radical economic and political vision. And his supporters were openly arming themselves, preparing for the day that this former Hollywood screenwriter turned mystic would supposedly be swept into political power. This is Star Spangled Fascism, The Chief and the Legion, part two. He's a tough guy, he's got a bunch of tough guys behind him, and he's ready to fight if that's what it takes to accomplish his aims. I'm historian Bradley W. Hart, author of the award-winning book, Hitler's American Friends. In this podcast, we're examining fascist leaders and movements that have emerged here in the United States over the past century. We'll look at what fueled their authoritarian ambitions, the supporters who flocked to them, and the Americans who stood in their way. In this episode, we continue the story of the would-be American dictator, William Dudley Pelley, as he assembles and leads thousands of followers nationwide into a movement that intends to sweep democracy aside and create a white supremacist, anti-Semitic, and anti-communist fascist movement. Pelley calls it the Christian Commonwealth. With the help of Pelley biographer Scott Beekman, we pick up with Pelley having surrounded himself with like-minded, well-armed fanatics. Known as the Silver Legion and its militant wing called the Actionists, they're looking to stir things up all over the country. Pelley, in, in documents that I've seen, calls for his supporters to stockpile weapons and ammunition. He himself is known to carry at least one gun. Yes. The Actionists get into, at points scuffles, if not rolling street battles. I think what separates the Legion from some of the other groups we're talking about on the podcast is this real open embrace of violence. Why does Pelly make this move towards openly calling for what appears to be laying the groundwork for some sort of war? What is he intending to do here and why put himself out there like that? I think if he had it to do over again, he probably wouldn't have put himself out there quite like that because the actionist cadres are the ones that lead directly to the government keeping a closer eye on him. I think for Pally, part of this is that he did believe that he was going to create the Commonwealth. And out of a recognition that there were those dark souls and dark forces that are going to be arrayed against the creation of the Commonwealth. And he was convinced that if you try to do this, Jews and groups that are allied with Jews or are working for Jews are going to push back and they're not going to be afraid to get violent. And he has to, therefore, have a way to counter and challenge the violence that he's going to be confronted with by these groups that he is trying to marginalize and ghettoize. I think in some ways, like Mussolini, he loved to have that portrayal of himself as the strong man, right? He's a tough guy. He's got a bunch of tough guys behind him. He's ready to fight if that's what it takes to accomplish his aims. So I think a lot of our listeners are probably thinking, how would this actually happen? How would someone like a William Dudley <laughs> Pelley obtain power? This is an answer you may not have because I'm not sure he had it either. Yeah. But it seems like a lot of these groups have these grand and almost delusional, I think, yes. ambitions to create a Nazi dictatorship in the U.S. And I, I don't think anyone really doubts this, their sincerity of belief in that. But did Pelley have an actual plan for this? Not really. He was great on plans, not so great on execution of those plans. And so the Silver Shirt Legion itself has this really elaborate structure that there was never enough people to actually fill out that structure. Who joins the Silver Legion? You have some really interesting data points on this in your book. And one thing that I always ask myself, and I'm sure the listeners do too, is how many people actually fell into this stuff? Exact numbers are really hard to come by. And so the best estimate is somewhere around 15,000 at its peak these are overwhelming the old stock Americans, Northern and Western European backgrounds. I have a strong suspicion that a lot of these guys who end up as silver shirts in 1933, 1934, were also involved in the Klan in 1927, 1928, before the Klan implodes in many ways at the end of the decade. And so I think it's appealing to the same sort of folks. And what we have to keep in mind is that Klan of the 1920s was not a Southern organization. It's an organization that is in the North, that's in the East, that's in the West. The Klan's strength in the 1920s is the state of Indiana, and not somewhere we typically associate with the KKK. Pelly and the Silver Shirts are strongest in, in many of the same areas as the Klan was. And so I suspect some of those guys are, are there's some overlap between the, the Klan and what Pelly was doing with the Silver Shirts. 
The issue he runs into, though, is that the Klan was a traditionally Christian organization. Pelly has liberation doctrine, which is not a very traditional form of Christianity, melded on top, which causes him all sorts of problems because he has folks who will buy into the religion, but not the anti-Semitism, or they'll buy into the anti-Semitism, but not the religion. This idea of liberation doctrine is a big deal for Pelly and his followers. It's basically the idea that it's somehow possible to communicate with Jesus and other key figures in Christianity and history as well, using spiritualist techniques to gain a deeper understanding of the universe. There's a lot of people who are interested in spiritualism in the early 20th century, but many of them find it difficult to align their Christianity with the ideas of communicating with people from beyond the grave. I always find it interesting to look at the types of people who get involved with these movements. I think you talk about the fact that a lot of the members, as far as you could trace them, were middle class or upper middle class professionals. There were doctors, there were lawyers. What did you find most surprising in the demographics? Pelly is able to attract uh, a a certain upper middle class educated group to the Silver Shirts. And I also think that's a reflection of the fact that those are folks who might be more amenable to alternative religions than someone that we would think of as a traditional clan member who's going to have a very traditional idea of what Christianity and religion looks like. So by mid-1930s, by 1934, really a year after the Legion comes into existence, they're already getting monitored by the federal government. Yes. One interesting document I've found is a memo in the House Un-American Activities Committee archive, supposedly written by Pelley. It's undated, but it's got to be before 1934 ordering one of his leaders to travel to Germany to make direct connections with the Nazi party and even set up a gun-running operation from Germany to the United States. Have you seen this document, number one? Do you think it's genuine, number two? And what does this tell us, number three, about the relationship between Pelley and the Germans? I'm a little skeptical of the validity of that claim, in part because one of the things that we know that got him in trouble was that his actionist boys didn't really have all that much trouble getting weapons here. And in the 1930s, it was even easier to obtain firearms in the United States than it is today. And it's pretty easy to do today. So I don't know that you necessarily would have had to look to Germany to get weapons. So I think he wanted a relationship with Hitler and with the Nazis. I don't think he necessarily, though, needed a relationship with Hitler and the Nazis. And I certainly don't think he needed it as a way to get weapons. Again, they had plenty of and were coming by legally and illegal means in the United States. But this theme of obtaining weaponry for this eventual war or whatever we want to call it, insurrection revolution, right. however they're going to take power for or whatever reason they're building up these arsenals, really, I think, comes to a head in 1934 in San Diego, where there's a quite serious incident and one that would be very shocking, I think, if it happened today, where there is a Silver Legion member who actually obtains quite a lot of weaponry and ammunition from the National Guard Armory there. The San Diego Silver Shirt Legion group in question was led by a guy named Willard Kemp, and Kemp obtains weapons from the National Guard. He obtains some weapons legally. There's weapons that are stolen. He reaches out to military men to try to get them to give them weapons, which is what comes back to haunt him because some of those guys report what has happened and what these guys are trying to do, and so they get infiltrated very quickly. And Kemp led one of the actionist groups of the Legion. And these were guys who really were truly looking to fight. They were looking to go after Jews. They were looking to go after communists. They were looking to go after groups they thought was un- were un-American. I-, I think it's important to keep in mind this is the first step by Kemp, not necessarily by Helly. And there's really, despite the fact that he encouraged his actionist groups and loved having those actionist groups, there really isn't a lot of direct evidence that Pelly went out and told him Go get these weapons illegally and storm San Diego. But regardless of whether Pelly himself had authorized Kemp's actions, the San Diego plot was truly chilling. Kemp had drilled 200 armed followers on a fortified ranch for months, preparing for an armed assault on the city. His plan was to launch an attack on the city during San Diego's May Day Parade, an important day for the left, and a day when the local Communist Party was expected to hold a big demonstration. Kemp's idea was that the Silver Legion could use the May Day gathering to trap the communists, capture City Hall, and set a nationwide revolution in motion. Much of the city's local Jewish community would be killed, including prominent public officials. 
and all of this would be presented to the public as a preemptive strike against an alleged communist takeover of the city, essentially as a defensive action. But like so many other Silver Legion plots, this plan ultimately came to nothing. The communist demonstration itself never actually materialized, and Kemp didn't have the excuse he needed to move forward with the plan. And meanwhile, those infiltrators in the group were already talking to federal investigators and local law enforcement. There would even be congressional hearings about the San Diego plot just a few months later, exposing Kemp and Pelly to even more scrutiny. So even if Pelly hadn't cooked up the details of the San Diego plot himself, or even necessarily been consulted about them, there was little doubt that his ideas were the inspiration behind this plan. So Scott, I have to ask, how much of a threat did Pelly himself pose in this period versus the threat posed by his diehard supporters who were inspired by his ideas? Is he a legitimate threat? I think is a question that uh, probably a lot of folks had. I think government officials were very aware of him and thought of him as a serious problem that could potentially be an even larger problem down the road. I don't know if the general American who heard the name William Dudley Pelly in the silver shirts at that point necessarily took him that seriously. So one aspect of Pelly's career is that he goes through these massive up and down periods where he is successful in the newspaper business and the newspaper business is on its back. He's right. very successful in Hollywood and then he gives it all up to become a spiritualist. Very successful in spiritualism and now making the move in, into politics. And much like the rest of his career, he's about to encounter some pretty serious turbulence in his new career as the wannabe American dictator. By the mid-1930s, Pelly actually is facing some pretty serious legal charges related to that pivot yes. from the spiritualist world into the political. What happens here? So he gets in trouble with the state of North Carolina over the, I would generously put, financial irregularities of his various operations. And, and one of the things that, that Pelly frequently did is he would change the name of his press, he would change the name of his organizations, he would create new incorporated entities, he'd move money from one to the other without really keeping any kind of record or justification of it. And then he would burn his records to make sure no one would have them. And what gets him in trouble in North Carolina was a violation of their blue sky laws with regards to the selling of stock, that he was trying to sell stock in North Carolina in companies that didn't have the level of solvency that he claimed they had. So there were 11 counts that he was found guilty of, and they all revolved around financial issues and stock issues related to his various companies. And ultimately, the records that convict him, as I recall, come from the people that have bought the stock, not from his records. Right. Yes. And he also had, you know, one of the things that Pelly always has problems with is their disgruntled former employees <laughs> that he has driven away who were happy to testify against him. So Pelly ends up getting convicted in the state of North Carolina, but the judge gives him a suspended sentence on the condition that he doesn't leave the state. But now Pelly turns his anger about the criminal conviction on a specific group in particular, the Jews. His anti-Semitism, I think, I would argue, if, if it's even possible, to become more pronounced. And he also really begins turning his ire on FDR, claiming that FDR is somehow responsible in some ways for his legal difficulties. I'm happy to report but after years of uncertainty, culminating in the collapse of the spring of 1933, we are bringing order out of the old chaos with a greater certainty of the employment of labor at a reasonable wage. And he begins referring to the New Deal, which FDR is passing and enacting simultaneously with this happening, as the Jew Deal, as a lot of anti-Semites referred to it. To what degree do you see really Pelly's legal troubles driving his views in this period? I think he the views were there. Certainly the anti-Semitism is quite obvious before he gets into legal trouble. But once he starts having legal problems, I think it reinforces those beliefs because it convinces him that he's correct, that he is someone who's out there speaking the truth about these groups who is trying to save America and that the groups, uh, the Jews and the allies of the Jews and the, the Jew stooges, as he would put it, are now actively campaigning and working against him, and they're using any mechanism possible. They're using the courts, again, because he became increasingly paranoid. There were times where he was convinced he was going to be assassinated, which is one of the reasons he needs those actionist boys in the Silver Shirt Legion to protect him. And he becomes convinced that Roosevelt is working for the Jews. And it changes over time. 
that's Roosevelt working for the Jews, but there are certainly times where he then will also claim that Roosevelt actually is a Jew, that he's Franklin Delano Rosenfeld. And so it's always the Jews that are at the base of any issues he has legally or any other part of his life. So for a man who's been convicted and put on parole effectively in North Carolina, forming a national political party and running for president seems like a bold move. And yet this is exactly what William Dudley Pelley does in 1935 in preparation for the 1936 election. Why does Pelley create what's called the Christian Party in 1935? And why does he think he has any chance of defeating FDR in 1936? Had he not been arrested and convicted in North Carolina, he might not have taken that step. But to Pelley, that is a clear indication that they are coming after him and that the levers of government are going to be used against him and that he needs to do something directly to stop that from happening. And the best way possible for that to happen is for him to be elected president of the United States. And it's the Christian party, again, because he always steadfastly claimed that he was a Christian. And there was a certain belief on his part that would be something that would resonate with a lot of Americans because it's the Christian party, right? It's traditional values. He's a good God-fearing man. Maybe they'll give him a chance and, and vote for him. He fails miserably. He's only on the ballot in Washington state, which again reflects that he always has these big plans, but never a lot of ways to actually implement those plans the 1936 election is a total disaster. This bold action results in him actually losing to even the Communist Party candidate in, in the one state he's <laughs> yes. on, Washington State. Not only is he nowhere near becoming an American dictator effectively, he's nowhere near even winning a single state effectively. So membership after 1936 is dropping fairly substantially within the Silver Legion. We think it gets down to perhaps as low as 5,000 members, which, as you said, it's tough to know what their overall numbers were. But this is perhaps a third of what it would have been right. in, let's say, 19, 1934. And there's also significant pushback as the 1930s go on from both the U.S. government and from anti-Nazi grassroots groups, really. I've seen accounts in my research of American Legion members going after silver shirts when they're holding meetings. What were these guys facing increasingly as the 1930s went on? Sure. So there is absolutely a, an increase in government surveillance. They're, the federal government's keeping a much closer eye on these guys. I think some of the folks who were tied to Pelly early on, become disillusioned after San Diego. They become disillusioned after his trial that makes him look like he is something of a con man. And you also have a very concerted and well-organized anti-Nazi movement in the United States, much of it directed by popular front organizations that are able to go in and legitimately protest against what Pelly is doing and try to break up some of these meetings that the Silver Shirts are having or that Pelly is trying to organize. And so suddenly that violence of the Silver Shirts is being met by violence from groups who are opposed to the Silver Shirts. And you also have an increasing campaign in American magazines and newspapers to protest and, and criticize that or sort of rolls into an event that gets roundly described as the, the Brown Scare, where suddenly Americans are concerned about what Hitler is doing. They're concerned about what Mussolini is doing. They're increasingly concerned about what the lackeys of those guys are doing in the United States. And they see things like the silver shirts who are bringing violence to their rallies as a threat. And so for him, I think the view is that the religion is maybe a safer way forward because it isn't facing the same sort of attacks and observation from the government that the Silver Shirt Legion and his political ideas were. And yet it, it seems in a lot of ways like he's already sown the seeds of his own destruction here. And by yeah. 1939, it seems like that the path that Pelley is going to take is increasingly not determined by him, but determined in large part by the U.S. government. <laughs> Um, 1938, Congress creates the House Committee Investigating Un-American Activities, chaired by Congressman Martin Dyes Jr. of Texas. And Pelley is one of Dyes' first targets. Um, for our listeners, this was a committee that would actually had investigators all over the country who would infiltrate meetings, report back to D.C. They held hearings all over the country, would subpoena people. Sometimes people went on the run to avoid being subpoenaed uh, by the Dyes Committee. And actually, this Pelly has some interesting interactions with the Dyes Committee as well. Initially, he is deemed, quote, un-American by the committee. And then he actually sues them for libel and refuses to testify. Yes, he goes on the run and, and refuses to come to Washington. And then in a, 
a really misguided and, and confusing, frankly, interlude in, in Pelly's life. He randomly shows up and testifies before the Dice Committee. They had no idea he was coming. They weren't sure what to ask him at that point. And not only does he randomly show up, but he randomly shows up and tries to paint himself as a patriotic American who's very supportive of Martin Dyes and what HUAC is trying to do. It's confusing to them. Uh, and I think it probably also was confusing to some of his followers. I, I think he probably lost some support because he went in there and effectively groveled with, uh, in front of Martin Dyes. And, well, Martin Dyes, I think, actually isn't there that day. As I no, recall, he's out with right, the flu. Right. So it's the, it's the Dyes committee chaired by one of his – before the committee. Then he gets himself arrested literally after testifying because North Carolina has finally tracked him down. Yes, It was a mistake on many levels to pop in on the Dyes Committee. North Carolina views him as being in violation of his parole because he was not supposed to leave the state of North Carolina. And so as soon as he leaves the Dyes Committee, he is arrested and taken back to North Carolina because he is in violation of his parole. So he's in jail very briefly, and then he appeals, which allows him to get back out of jail. When we come back, We'll talk about how Pelly manages to put himself in even more legal jeopardy. The big challenge for this wannabe American Hitler is now staying out of prison. So we fast forward now to December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor. After Pearl Harbor, really, all of these extremist groups face significant pressure from the U.S. government. Up until this point, the FBI, the Dyes Committee, can investigate these groups all they want, but unless they find actual evidence of federal crimes being committed that stands up in court, there's not really much they can do. What does Pelly do when Pearl Harbor happens, and why in some ways do you think he doesn't just shut his mouth at that point? He, <laughs> that's a really good question. I mean, he wasn't good at shutting his mouth. I think that's the easy answer to that one. After Pearl Harbor, he remains steadfastly pro-Germany. He argued that our involvement in World War II, much like our involvement in World War I, was another example of the Jews controlling our government and getting us involved in a war. And he, he remains steadfastly opposed to American involvement in the war. And that refusal to get on board with the war effort is going to get him in serious trouble with the federal government. Franklin Roosevelt, once we get involved in the war, is adamant that he wants the Department of Justice to go after some of these guys who he believes are hindering the war effort by being critical of our involvement. And for Pelley, that all then devolves into another arrest, in this case on federal charges, because one of his magazines was found in a duffel bag belonging to a recruit who was going to camp. And in the magazine, There are some statements against the war effort. And so he is rung up on a bunch of federal charges for hindering the war effort, for promoting subversion within the military, and for encouraging troops to not fight. And he's found guilty. And he's found guilty and is sentenced to 15 years in prison. At one point in the trial, his defense attorney slips and calls him Mr. Hitler. He probably was going to lose anyway, but that those sorts of things really did not help his case at all. A very unhelpful, perhaps Freudian <laughs> slip there uh, on his on his attorney's part. So, Pelly sits out the entirety of World War II in federal custody. Effectively, he actually gets out after eight years of his sentence um, in 1950. Why did they release this man earlier? Um, so his daughter Adelaide had a massive letter writing campaign to try to convince the federal government to release him early. And he is, by all accounts, a a fairly model prisoner. And so there's not really a reason to keep someone in prison for protesting against World War II five years after the war is over. I think it was a valid decision on their part to go ahead and let him go in 1950. At that point, he's nearing the tail end of his life. He's served his time. The war is over. Fascism and Nazism has been defeated. What possible reason could you allow him to stay in jail because he's also going to be viewed as something of a a political prisoner, right? Because he is this staunch anti-communist who is now being locked up in a period where anti-communism is the, the dominant political view in the United States. 
And that's a fascinating point that I make in my book as well, that that's a rhetorical turn that you see happen in the U.S. in the late 40s, early 50s, that no matter what you can say about these guys who had been fascist sympathizers in the 1930s, they definitely weren't communists right, exactly. effectively. And, and in the era of McCarthyism, it's easy in some ways for us to overlook the fact that that's a turn that is very popular. And so we shouldn't assume that because these people had been the subject of scrutiny by the government or even convicted of crimes in the past that they wouldn't be in some way almost rehabilitated or at least let back into the public sphere in the 1950s and beyond. Sure. And actually, this happens to Pelly to some extent as well, but not in a political sense. If you're listening to the podcast and thinking, <laughs> this is the end of the Pelly story, you are actually not correct. The Pelly story goes on, but it reverts back in some ways to the spiritualism aspects of the 1920s, but it takes a very sci-fi direction, which I find really fascinating. After Pelly gets out in 1950, he begins creating a new, I don't know what to call it even, is it a religion, is it an approach to religion, that he calls soulcraft. You have a much deeper understanding of what soulcraft is. I really know about it from your book and from trying to decipher some of the soulcraft materials. What, what is soulcraft and how does it relate to Pelly's wider ideas? So soulcraft is, in many ways, it is just a continuation of the liberation doctrine of the 1930s in that it is rooted in ideas of higher planes of existence. It's rooted in, at its very base, in reincarnation and the idea that souls gain knowledge with each reincarnation, which according to Pelly would happen every four or five hundred years or so. Probably the biggest thing that I personally have gotten out of soulcraft has been this fact. This is not a world, however much it seems so, that is permitted to run itself, get into imponderable snarls of itself, muddle along from age to age by itself, and work out its ultimate salvation or destruction of itself. That's the voice of the chief himself, William Dudley Pelly. I don't mean by this that God Almighty okays or orders every little happening that occurs. Personally, I don't think the Lord God gives one kopeck's worth of notice to the infinitesimal happenings to human beings. What he does seem to do is to let human beings, as they go in and out of physical bodies in physical lives, one after the other, choose and determine their own careers with their tragedies and successes and fears and hopes and quandaries, knowing that everything that happens to them has a profitable spiritual lesson for their growing, developing characters. The trouble with most of us is that we're sealed up mentally after getting into life as to what we've selected to go through for ourselves, knowing we need the profit from mortal adventurings and experiencings. And in that sealed up condition, which we think of as blindness, not knowing that the most difficult passages or sequences of our lives have really been selected by ourselves in advance. Eventually, you would reach a stage where you could move on to a different plane of existence and not have to keep coming back to Earth because you learned everything you possibly could here. And that if your soul continued to make that progress on higher planes, eventually you would sort of reach Godhead status and be allowed to then rule a particular part of one of these higher planes of existence. For Pelly, he had certainly toyed with the idea that humanity originally came from outer space in the 1930s. That he talks about that humans are, are star guests. And in Soulcraft, he takes that idea and then melds onto it a lot of the then current sort of mania over UFO sightings. And so Pelly uses the interest in UFOs and the claims that the aliens are visiting us as evidence for what he's arguing in Soulcraft, that these are visitors from outer space who are coming to see how people are doing on Earth, to see the progress of individual souls on Earth, because these are individuals who have reached a higher plane of existence. And so he becomes deeply tied into this early UFO movement as part of his sort of fleshing out of Soulcraft as a religion, because he's enjoined from any overtly political writings and teachings, and so it becomes all about the religion, and he can have some muted racism and anti-Semitism embedded in Soulcraft. It's just not as explicit as it was with Liberation Doctrine or with the Christian Commonwealth. 
And what's fascinating as a historian for me is that, that he's a direct link, maybe the only one, tell me if I'm wrong here, between 1920s spiritualism and the emergence of the UFO movement yep. in the 1950s. Yes, and for Pelly, what's what's beneficial is that when you look at the early contactees, their portrayal of the aliens is effectively sort of space aliens, right? These guys look like Hitler's master race. They, they're white and they're blonde-haired and they're blue-eyed. And so for Pelly, that can then feed into those anti-Semitic and racist beliefs that he al already had, because now he can argue, well, look, these folks have reached higher planes and they're Aryans. So what is Pelly's legacy today? If, if our listeners go out and Google Pelly, and I, I did this right before <laughs> our interview, they'll find the stuff that we're talking about, about the 1930s. They'll find a lot more about the stuff we're talking about right now. Yes, there's a, a certain level of respect that Pelly gets in New Age circles that he doesn't necessarily get in modern neo-Nazi operations. And I think that it's the religion that causes modern day American neo-Nazis pause in many respects, that he's claiming to be a Christian when the sort of standard view of, of Nazis is that Jesus was a Jew and that Christianity is a, is a Jewish religion. William Pelly dies in 1965 at the age of 75, a fairly young man by today's mm -hmm. standards, a, a lifelong smoker, yes. however, which uh, probably curtailed his life. And I find it really interesting that his headstone uh, doesn't reference his Christian name. It simply reads chief. Yes. What do you make of that? Um, I think it's a reflection of that Pelly viewed himself as the chief. And I think he wanted to be remembered as someone who had channeled and brought these messages and that there would be a religion that lived on long past him and that Someday, if Soulcraft takes over as the dominant religion in the United States, the pilgrimage spot would be in the grave of the chief. So in the end, it seems to me that Pelly is most successful and stays out of trouble the most when he hews to either being a popular writer or writing spiritualist texts and, or, or talking about religious matters. The political side of it seems to be where he got himself into a whole lot of trouble, ends up going to prison for a long time because of this stuff. Do you think Pelly regretted fascism? Do you think he regretted getting into politics? That's a really good question. I'm inclined to say no, simply because it was part of his idea and identity that he was going to be a prominent political leader. And I suspect Pelly would have argued that he couldn't necessarily do that purely with the religion, that there had to be a political component to it. And I also think we have to acknowledge that he truly believed in anti-Semitism. And it was not something he adopted as an expedient. He truly believed there were these problems with Jews and felt compelled to step in and try to do something about that along with his religious beliefs. But I suspect that he died thinking he, he did something important with his political work in the same way that I'm sure he believed he did something important with his religious work. My guest on Star Spangled Fascism has been Scott Beekman, author of the fantastic book, William Dudley Pelly, A Life in Right-Wing Extremism and the Occult. Highly recommended. It's a great read, Scott. Congratulations again, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me, Bradley. In our next episodes, we'll take a deep dive on one of the most influential media figures in American history. He's a Catholic priest who turned his eyes towards politics to become one of Franklin Roosevelt's staunchest critics and who increasingly supported Hitler and the Nazis. Father Charles Coughlin had a radio audience larger than any other in American history, and a base of dedicated and sometimes armed supporters all around the country. There's no modern doppelganger for Charles Coughlin, and I don't think that we ever will have somebody that powerful with that much of a reach again. Special thanks to Scott Beekman, author of the book, William Dudley Pelly, A Life in Right-Wing Extremism and the Occult. This program was edited by Brian Fantanelli, mixed and mastered by Joseph Powers, and executive produced by Brendan Gokel. Be sure to subscribe to the Star Spangled Fascism podcast wherever you get your podcasts, on our YouTube page, and follow us now on social media. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Dr. B. W. Hart. I'll be posting previews from our upcoming episodes there, and feel free to leave your comments. If you have a question about the podcast, email us at questions at starspangledfascismpodcast.com. I'm Bradley W. Hart. Thank you for listening. <laughs>